Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about validity and reliability in qualitative research. So in qualitative research, validity and reliability are handled differently than in quantitative research. Um, so there are lots of different methods that we can use in qualitative research to help demonstrate the validity and improve the validity. Um, so first, triangulations. That's the use of multiple methods or sources of data. The idea is that the more sources of data that we have, the more confident we can be in the validity of the data, especially assuming that those sources of data agree on the different themes and, and findings in your research. Um, member checking is a process where as you're collecting and analyzing data, you can then go back to those participants and share with them some of the themes and insights that you've been collecting and check that the member, not the members, but that the participants agree with your uh, findings and that they agree with those insights and themes that you're finding. Um, so you want to see that they agree or that what you are sharing with them resonates with them and their experiences and is truly a representation of what they tried to share with you. Uh, you also should include a rich, thick description, which is referring to detailed narratives um, to describe an experience or observation. So the more detail that you share, the more rich is the description, um, the more the reader can be confident in the validity of the research that you're doing. So it gives more context to uh, the themes and the, the insights that you're sharing and that you receive from participants. So more context will contribute to greater validity. Uh, clarify bias. So you want to clearly state any potential biases that you, the researcher, might have. Uh, negative information. So when you are collecting and analyzing your data, um, it's likely that a lot of participants will agree and have similar ideas, but it's likely that there will be some who have contrasting ideas, some who don't agree with the rest of the group. And that can actually be very powerful in demonstrating your point and showing that um, the rest of the group, the answers that they're providing are valid. Because if you look for the participant who disagrees and has a different experience from everyone else, and you're able to explain why it's likely that they had a different experience, um, then that can be very powerful in adding to your validity. Um, so if you can explain why they likely felt different or had a different experience, that's very helpful. So it could be related to their demographic or their educational status or where they live or, you know, find some difference with that participant that could potentially explain why they they perceived things differently or had a different experience from the rest. An external auditor would be if you invite a researcher who is not part of this research study and who's maybe not familiar with the phenomenon that you're studying. So it's just fresh eyes and they can look over your methodology and look over your data analysis and determine whether they agree with how you have done the analysis and, and they can see if your results match with the participants' responses, so with the data itself, in their opinion, of course. Uh, peer debriefing is very, very similar, but in that case, you're bringing in a researcher, again, who is not part of your study, um, but somebody who is familiar with the population you're studying or the phenomenon that you're studying, um, so they will be able to challenge you a bit more um, and they'll be able to challenge your procedures and ask tougher questions um, because they will be more intimately familiar with the type of project that you're doing. Um, and then lastly, prolonged time in the field. Um, so it can be helpful for the researcher to continue to observe and spend time at the setting where they're collecting uh, their data or in a setting where their participants are you know, a lot where they are. Um, so if you spend more time, you can follow any hunches that you have, you can compare uh, whether your interview data that the participants provided uh, is, are consistent with 
what you observe when you are seeing them uh, in their natural setting. Um, so like maybe you interview a group and they're telling you about their physical activity or how likely they are to choose the stairs over the escalator or anything like that. And well, if you hang around in their setting for a while and observe, you can see if it's true that yes, they do tend to take the stairs more than the escalator, or maybe they claimed that they did, but you're observing and everyone you're seeing is taking the escalator. Um, so that's a way that you can add validity to your data. Okay, reliability and qualitative research. So uh, the researcher uses an approach that is consistent across different analysts and projects. Um, so you wanna make sure that it's a very consistent approach, especially if you have multiple researchers that are analyzing and interpreting the data. You wanna make sure that you have a plan for analysis and interpretation that each of the different researchers can uh, apply very consistently. Uh, you want to double and triple check the manuscript, or not the manuscripts, the transcripts for mistakes. Um, so if somebody is transcribing interviews or face, um, I almost said Facebook groups, uh, focus groups, <laughs> if somebody is transcribing, uh, then you want to make sure, you know, have somebody else double check and make sure that there are no errors. Um, you want to ensure no drift in definition of codes. So if the codes are defined early on, you want to make sure that as researchers are continuing to code the data, maybe for months on end as you're collecting data over time, you want to make sure that those codes are still uh, being assessed according to the original definitions that were laid out in the beginning. Uh, and then again, if you have multiple researchers who are coding um, or analyzing or interpreting any of the data, you want to make sure that those different researchers are communicating with one another and that the researchers are cross-checking each other's work to make sure that everyone is uh, assessing the data consistently. All right, so generalizability. Qualitative research in general is not generalizable. Um, so qualitative research has limitations. We have to assume that the results of a qualitative study really only apply to the group and the situation that is being currently studied. So you want to really focus on the particularity of your study so that um, like there, it won't be generalizable. So we can't focus on that. So you want to focus on um, the new interesting thing that you found in this study, in this particular setting with these particular participants, and that is what is meaningful and interesting about the study. Uh, we can't generalize it to a broader population because we can't be sure that the participants in this study are representative of the broader population. Um, now, with that said, qualitative research may be generalizable to broader theory, meaning that the qualitative results might be in support of a theory, so in support of an existing theory, or it might lead to developing a new theory. Um, but that is different from saying that the results are generalizable to a population. So if I conduct a qualitative study at a school, for example, I can't expect that my results of that study are going to be generalizable to similar students at a different school. Because if it's a different school, then it is a different population. And it's possible that the same results apply, but we can't know that without conducting the same study at that additional institution. All right, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you for the next video.